Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, well, the last podcast was the Ezra Klein episode. Glad that one's behind me. Many of you are apparently thankful that that conversation took place. I can't say that I share your enthusiasm for it. But I guess if there's a silver lining there, it is that it is an interesting document. It's one of these pieces of audio that reveals two ostensibly smart and morally serious people talking past one another for hours on end. My friend Eric Weinstein, when he heard it, tweeted, holy cow, this was fascinating. An exquisite intellectual train wreck of an almost conversation. We appear to have reached a point where the conversations we need to have simply cannot be had. That final pessimistic turn Seems warranted, I'm afraid. Anything I say here will sound fairly self-serving, but I do see this in a, an extremely one-sided way, and I don't think I'm wrong about what happened there. I really did try to give Klein the benefit of the doubt, and as I said at the outset, it was perfectly possible that my allegations of bad faith that I had made in the email exchange had been made in error. Email is a famously limited window onto another person's mind, but I'm sorry to say that my view of Klein was not improved by our podcast. I feel that I actually met the person I imagined I was dealing with by email. That's not to say there weren't things that I could have done better. There certainly were, and so in part I view it as my failure, but whether doing those things better would have made a difference, I don't actually know. But the dynamics of what was happening in that podcast certainly could have been made much clearer had I done a few things differently. It impresses me how hard it is for people to follow the logic of how we were missing each other and how asymmetrical that logic was. And that is a testimony to the fact that the conversation was had poorly enough on my side that anyone could hear what they wanted to hear in it. It is simply a fact that Klein was being totally unresponsive to my points and literally dodging everything of substance. And that would have been much clearer if I simply asked more questions. What I tended to do, and I I tend to do this often, and it's not usually this much of a liability, but since there was so much that I thought I should say and that I thought the audience needed to hear, I would talk for good chunks of time and then Klein could ignore 95% of what I said and just seize on some innocuous bit at the end and then wander off into oblivion. And I should have just asked pointed questions and forced him to respond to the half a dozen key points that he dodged. Anyway, I'll resist the temptation to do a long post-mortem on the podcast, but I will point out a couple of things. We were talking past one another, but we weren't talking past one another in the same way. And the difference is, I had an argument for why most of what Klein was saying was irrelevant to the conversation. He had no such argument about what I was saying. He simply never addressed what I was saying. For instance, the, the point I made about Neanderthal DNA. As I said, in 2014, it was found that most people are walking around with something like 2.7% Neanderthal DNA in their genomes. That is, with the exception of black people. And as I told Klein, I I tweeted at the time, this is back, again, back in 2014, attention all racists. You are right. Whites are special. We're part Neanderthal. Blacks are just human. And I asked Klein to consider what would have happened if the data had run the other way, and the only people on Earth who were part Neanderthal happened to be black. Now, needless to say, he dodged this point, as he dodged every other like it. But the reality is that Klein appears to be happy to live in a world where, had the science gone the other way, the scientist or journalist who was left holding those data when the music stopped would have had his or her reputation destroyed. 
In fact, Klein is working very hard to create such a world. And ironically, it's a world where Klein's political goals of equality will be much harder to achieve. Political equality simply does not require that we imagine that individuals or groups are identical. It can't require that, because individuals are never identical, and groups aren't likely to be either. And our commitment to building the best possible world for people to flourish in can't depend on our line about this. So the, the idea that our politics are put in jeopardy by some possible set of scientific facts, that is an illusion we have to cut through. And that's what I was trying to do in my conversation with Klein. So I found the conversation very frustrating, as many of you did. But I did learn a couple of things from this whole episode. First is that social media has been making me a worse person, and I need to change how I engage with it, which I've now done. So that is a good thing. And the second is that I was laboring under the delusion that I should be able to reach the far left in a way that I never thought I needed to reach the far right. At no point in my day or in any one of my podcasts do I wonder what can I say to convince a neo-Nazi that he's wrong. Okay, it's not that such a thing would be impossible, but generally speaking, I don't consider neo-Nazis to be part of my audience. It's now clear to me that I need to view the far left that way as well. So it's not that I'm going to avoid hard conversations or even the topic of race in the future. In fact, I'm planning to invite some African-American scholars on the podcast to get deeper into this issue with me, because it's important. And the idea that I can't talk about race or racism or even confusion about racism because of the color of my skin, that's insane. So I'm not going to be scared off this issue. But there are many people in Ezra's audience, and Ezra appears to be one of them, who came away from that podcast convinced that I'm either a racist or motivated by white identity politics. And Ezra explicitly claimed the latter. Okay, at one point, he seemed to be saying that I might be practicing the identity politics of being a scientist or a public intellectual, as though that made any sense. But when I denied that I was practicing any kind of identity politics, he said, well, that's what folks from the dominant group get to do. Okay, they get to say, my thing isn't identity politics, only yours is. And Klein thought this was such a good point that he reiterated it in his intro to the podcast. This is what I believe he spoke on his podcast, but it's written in the framing on the, on the Vox website. Klein said, yes, identity politics are at play in this conversation, but that includes, as it always has, white identity politics. To Harris, and you'll hear this explicitly, identity politics is something others do. To me, it's something we all do, and that he and many others refuse to admit they're doing. This is one of the advantages of being the majority group. Your concerns get coded as concerns. It's everyone else who is playing identity politics. Well, I'm sorry, but that is just pure delusion. Again, I said enough in the podcast to have nullified this, but I'm sure this kind of thing convinced the totality of Klein's audience. I'll just remind you of another point he totally evaded. As I said, Klein and I could have had the same conversation about the way that the left has attacked Ayan Hirsi Ali, my friend from Somalia. The lying and the moral confusion and the smear campaigns, all of it has exactly the same structure. And as I asked Klein, is my defense of Ayan, which has absorbed far more of my time and moral energy than my defense of Charles Murray, is that an example of my white identity politics? I think I can anticipate his answer here. In this case, it would be an example of me using the some of my best friends are black defense of my own racism. I now am reluctantly recognizing that the far left is too far gone. And this is something I just said on Joe Rogan's podcast, but to give you a sense of how insane all of this has become, I was just at the TED conference and at a small dinner on one of the nights, seated next to a neuroscientist who has impeccable academic credentials, and he was of the opinion that Charles Murray should have been physically attacked when he went to Middlebury. That's how emotionally hijacked people are on this topic. 
in any case, I, I view that last podcast as a failure, but I hope it was an instructive one. Okay, so I have a few events to announce. You know about the one in L.A. with Antonio Damasio. That's in May. I have events with Jordan Peterson in Vancouver, which are sold out, but with Jordan Peterson and Douglas Murray in Dublin and London in July, which are still available. And two new events to announce. These are actually day-long conferences. These are not standalone lectures. These are whole-day events, one in Sydney and one in Auckland in August. And here I'm in very good company. I'm going with Majid Nawaz, Douglas Murray, and Eric Weinstein and Brett Weinstein. We have both the Weinstein brothers, and they will both be moderated by some local talent, the podcaster and journalist Josh Zepps. So uh, that should be fun. And those, all my events and the specific dates and venues are on my website. And pre sale tickets, as always, are available to subscribers. And my hope is that live streaming will be available to subscribers as well. Okay, so now for today's podcast. This is a, another live event. I said that I would be releasing these only to subscribers, ultimately, but I have a few already recorded that, because I had promised my guest that it would be released widely on my podcast, I'm going to honor that promise. And so this is my event with Sean Carroll, the physicist from Caltech, that we recorded in Portland. And as you might expect, we range over many topics, both of scientific interest and topics about which we disagree. And uh, people seem to like it in the room, and I hope you like it wherever you are. And now without further delay, I bring you Sean Carroll. So I'm going to jump right into this because we have a great guest. My guest tonight is a theoretical physicist from Caltech. He has a PhD from Harvard. He has worked on the foundations of quantum mechanics for some time. He's uh, focused on the emergence of complexity and the arrow of time. Uh, he's been awarded prizes of many sorts from NASA and the National Science Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, many other societies. He is also a consultant for film and television, and he has written a fascinating book, which unfortunately is not for sale here, but I, I highly recommend you get it. It's called The Big Picture on the Origins of Life, Meaning, and the Universe Itself. Uh, please welcome Sean Carroll. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, Sean, thanks for doing this. Thanks for coming out. Can I just say, these are the most comfortable seats yes. I've ever sat in on a stage. Like, every time I see pictures of you at the podcast, you have these wonderful overstuffed do you have a yeah. hookup or something? Strangely, you... I have very little control over what chairs actually arrive well, you here. You do very but, well. They're great. Um, but it seems to work out, at least in this universe. <laughs> so, That's there's, my there's next some book. other universe where we're both being tortured. <laughs> I don't know if you've been following along low these many years, but Sean and I have had a slightly prickly relationship online. And we've had disagreements in the past that I really would like to work through here. So this is... More than the usual podcast, this is an experiment in conversation. And I mean, there's, there's so much we agree about. There's so much we agree about in terms of just the importance of getting our hands around a realistic picture of what's going on in the world and using science as the basis for that conversation. But there are places where I think we have probably been talking past one another. And I, so I, I, w I want us to sneak up on our differences. And I want to use your book as the template for that. And again, your book is, is, is a fascinating look at, as advertised, the big picture. Let's start with this notion of what you call poetic naturalism. How do you frame your worldview? <laughs> sure. So poetic naturalism, there's two words. Naturalism is just the idea that there's only one world, the natural world, the world that we learn about by doing science, <laughs> the world that obeys rules and does its thing. So in other words, it's kind of defined in opposition to whatever might be not naturalism. If you believe that there were extra spirits or a realm of divinity or anything like that, that would not be naturalism. So naturalism is close to atheism in a sense, but rather than just saying there is something you could imagine called God and that God doesn't exist, 
It's a positive statement about what does exist, the natural world that we can study using science. And then the poetic is the idea that there are many ways of talking about that natural world, mm -hmm. which both means that there are different scientific ways. We can analyze it at the most comprehensive, fundamental level of particle physics and general relativity and so forth. There are more emergent levels that are still nevertheless scientific and descriptive, biology all the way up to um, sociology or psychology. And then there are levels where we might actually get more poetic, which are uh, involve aesthetics or judgments or values, where I would argue the descriptions are not fixed by the facts of the universe themselves. I think the difference between us, if there is one in the end, is in what we will ascribe to the poetic side of that dichotomy. So right, we're both naturalists, yeah, it's either, that's right. Yeah, it's either naturalist or not to talk about values and meaning and, and the good life. And again, let's creep up on that. So you certainly are a fan of the, the concept of the unity of knowledge. You don't think that there's a disjunction between levels. So you, if we're talking about physics, Everything above that as an emergent property is beholden to that as its you know, micro constituents. And it doesn't make sense to talk about cocktail parties and stock markets in terms of atoms merely. But at some level, reductionism runs through. Yes. I mean, certainly at the level of scientific description of, of what happens in the universe, um, the big thing that I try to push in the book is that there are these higher levels of emergent descriptions, but they better be compatible with the lower levels. And in particular, I'm not a fan of what even some of my scientific colleagues call downward causation. Right. The idea that somehow the shape of a macroscopic thing or the purpose of a macroscopic thing can feed back and change the behavior at the microscopic level in a way that you wouldn't have known about if you were just right. doing the microscopic level. I think that it really is reductionistic in, in that sense. In principle, we can build up. Now, in practice, when we do biology or chemistry or psychology, uh, there is a non-reductionist element in the sense that as a practical matter, the way to learn new things about biology is not to think about particle physics, right? right. We can discover regularities at the higher levels that are uh, we don't need to know about what's going on at the lower levels to discover them, but they still better be compatible with them. Right. So let's revisit that notion of, of downward causation because I, it has never made sense to me either. It's, so the, the idea is that you have a emergent properties like minds and consciousness and or just, just the macro level, as you say, shape of objects, right? right? So you have, you have co collections of atoms that at some higher level have you know, very, even, even temperature is an emergent property. I mean, one atom mm -hmm. doesn't have a temperature, but you get collections uh, together and, and then their motion is described as temperature. But this notion that a higher level phenomenon can then, by virtue of its existing at the higher level, come down and and have causal properties with respect to the lower level, how is it that people are endorsing <laughs> that idea? Because we have scientists who are yeah. talking in those terms. You've come to the wrong place, because yeah. I, you know, I, it's one of those ideas I've tried to understand. There's a lot of smart people who believe this is a very important part of how we describe nature. I've never even been able to understand what they're saying, really, I think. You know, well enough, you would like to understand something well enough to be able to give a good defense of it yourself before you said it, uh, it was wrong, which I don't, I don't think I can do. But right. the example on the level of basic physics that is sometimes given is the formation of snowflakes. You know, snowflakes have this six-fold symmetry, and they're all different, and they have this beautiful pattern. And people say, you know, at some level, it's water molecules sticking together. But to understand what any one individual water molecule is doing, you need to understand the whole shape of the snowflake. But if that's the example, it's just manifestly wrong. Like, if you really knew what every water molecule was doing, that's all you would need to know. There's right. the famous thought experiment of Laplace's demon, Pierre Simon Laplace back in circa the year 1800 said, if there were a vast intelligence that knew literally everything about the universe, the position, the velocity of every particle of matter in the cosmos, and knew all laws of physics and had infinite computing power, that intelligence could predict the past and retrodict the, the 
sorry, predict the future mm -hmm. and retrodict the past with perfect accuracy. So that's what we're imagining when we pretend to be fundamental physicists. If we were Laplace's demon, would you need to know that the water what molecule was part of a snowflake? I would say no. But of course, the real, the hidden agenda there is they want to use it to talk about consciousness, right? right? They want to say that somehow the fact that we are conscious changes how even our cells or atoms behave in a way that we wouldn't have guessed from reductionistic principles, and I, I just don't agree with that. Yeah, well, the problem there is, and this is a genuine mystery as to why consciousness would have evolved if it's an evolved property of creatures like ourselves, is that if consciousness is just arising by virtue of some micro-constituent phenomenon, so you have some level of information processing, by, in our case, you know, neurophysiology, if it is effective, it's, if consciousness is doing something, if there are certain mental operations that can't be done but for the fact that there's something that it's like to be doing right. those things, it still must be effective by virtue of its micro-level properties at the level of the brain. I mean, it's, it is neurons affecting neurons and, and their, their future states. Otherwise, you're talking about some magical influence. Well, that's right. And so the... There's a tension here, right? There's a tension between, on, many, on the part of many people, there's a reluctance to think that what it is like to be something, the hard problem of consciousness, can be explained simply as an emergent phenomena on the basis of what our atoms and molecules are doing. But at the same time, there are subsets of these people who are very much in favor of science and know that the atoms and molecules are doing something and they have their own laws of physics. So they're forced ultimately to panpsychism, mm. to the idea yeah. that there is a, not just a physical property of every particle of matter in the universe, but there are mental properties as well. And the mental properties aren't very efficacious in doing anything when it's just an atom or two. But when it comes together to make a whole person, then the mental properties come together to give us consciousness. Just saying it out loud makes me think, how could anyone ever believe that? But it is a surprisingly yeah. popular position in some circles. I'm probably yeah. not doing it justice. Well, it, but it's also hard to see how the universe would be different if that were so. I mean, I wouldn't expect this comfy chair to behave differently than it's behaving if there was something that it was like to be an electron, say. I mean, if, it's, if electrons buzz That's with some right. interior dimension of subjectivity, it's not like they're thinking thoughts or forming behavioral plans or, or feeling themselves to be in relationship. To yeah, I mean, to be f as fair as I can, it's not very conscious, the chair. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just a little bit conscious. Right. That's even, you know, an electron, David Chalmers will say, is maybe a little bit conscious. Right. And I, I, I think, you know, it, and it gets into, I don't know how much you want to discuss it, but then, of course, there's the famous philosophical zombie thought experiment. Can you imagine something that acts like a person but has no inner sensations, does not know what it is like to be a person, but acts exactly like a person would act? And to me, the answer is no, that's not even conceivable. Because if you asked a zombie, what are you feeling right now? It would say it's feeling something, because otherwise it would be acting differently, right? Mm -hmm. So why is the zombie lying to you all the time about feeling something inside? How do you know you're not a zombie yourself? Yeah. So yeah. I actually just don't think that's possible. And I think that ultimately the attempts to wriggle around basing reality in stuff obeying the laws of physics don't quite hold together. Yeah. Well, I think you and I are on the same page as far as consciousness still being fundamentally mysterious. And how, what, depends on your, how you're leading the word mysterious there. Well, it's just yes. like we, we, we haven't, we don't know at what level it arises in the physics of things. Sure. My yeah. message throughout the book and, and, and more broadly is, you know, the subtitle of my book is on the nature of life, meaning, and the universe itself. And even though we're not selling the books here, you can still buy them on Amazon from your phone right now. <laughs> Uh, but if you do, you will not learn the origin of life, the origin of the universe, or the, the meaning of life. The point is that I argue that we can talk about these things in the framework given to us by naturalism. Mm -hmm. I don't give you the answers. The answers are still things that we're looking for. That's how science works. I think they will someday be found, and I think there will ultimately be a naturalistic, physicalistic grounding for whatever it is we find them. In other words, there's no reason on the basis of what we currently know about the universe to put large credence in the idea that there's something beyond the physical world.
how do you think about possibility as a physicist? So, so we live in a world where certain things happen and certain things which we can imagine happening, which seem compatible with the way things might have happened, don't seem to happen. If, if your answer to this is some many worlds version of QM, that well, we're every, every yeah, the, so that yes. I'm interested in that, but how, how do you map this claim that something might have happened but didn't happen onto naturalism as a physicist? Well, I think that there's, yeah, there's two levels to that, as it were. Um, there is, we could go into, again, at whatever level of detail you want, the many worlds version of quantum mechanics, which is the one that I think is probably right. We don't know for sure. And in that version, when you specifically have a quantum mechanical measurement performed, so you have some quantum mechanical system, some other system that interacts with it, obeying the laws of physics, becomes entangled, and that's what we call a measurement. The universe, as it is described by the quantum state, branches into multiple possible but equally real different universes, one in which the spin was up, one in which the spin was down. I have an app on my iPhone that will do this that will actually that branch will, the wave function of the universe? Divide our universe? Yes. Again. So if, yeah. if you don't know what to do, if you're like, should I have Chinese yeah. food for dinner? Should I have pizza? Shatter you the can, universe? You could have one universe each, right? Yeah. So that doesn't mean that everything happens. It means that everything that are, is compatible with the laws of quantum mechanics happens with some non-zero probability, okay? Um, so... It is a feature of the world that there were relatively few branches of the wave function of the universe in the past, and there are relatively more in the future. So possibilities proliferate as time goes on. Now, there's also an entirely different discussion about the emergent levels of description, which are not comprehensive, where in some sense you're ignoring certain facts that are true about the universe. When, I, uh, when we discuss the air in this room, as a fluid with a temperature, a pressure, et cetera, we can make enormously successful predictions about how the air in this room will behave just on the basis of its fluid properties. And that's kind of miraculous because the total information about the air would be what Laplace's demon would have, right? The position and the velocity of every single molecule as well as its rotation and so forth. And miraculously, we don't need that information. We can do with much less information and still make wonderfully precise predictions, but not perfectly precise predictions. So because of that missing information, there's another sense of possibility that comes in, just the possibility based on ignorance, mm -hmm. that you make predictions on the basis of incomplete data, they're going to be probabilistic ones, not deterministic ones. But when you're talking about something that, that happens or not, what sense can be made of the claim that something else might have happened in that case? In the, in the many worlds version, everything that can happen is happening, yes. right? So, so in some sense, there is only the actual. It's, most of it's not in this universe, That's or, right. but, but it's still happening. So there was some use, possibility that I might have picked this up and put it down and then picked it up again and put it down and did that 75 times to the consternation yeah. of everyone in the room. <laughs> That, Hopefully the probability is low, yeah, but yes. But, but if there's a non-zero possibility of that, that happened somewhere, yes, right? Yes, that's right. And every, every other conceivable adumbration of that. So there's, right. you know, I, I was singing the Star Spangled Banner at one point when I was yep. doing that. Now, it gets worse than that, yeah, they, but uh, yes. I go, well, if you've heard me sing, you know, it doesn't get much <laughs> worse than that. Maybe it doesn't get worse. But... This is supposed to be science, right? But this sounds like the strangest and least believable idea on offer. Right? So, like, so how, how is it that science, after centuries of being apparently rigorous and parsimonious and hard-headed, finally disgorges a picture of reality which seems to be the least believable thing anyone's ever thought of? You're, you've come to the right place. Yes. You all have come to the right place. Uh, so let me just remember that there's this entirely different notion of possibility that we should get to, which is what could have happened given what we know, given that what we know wasn't everything. Uh, what we're talking about here with the many worlds interpretation is we know everything. We, let's, let's let us know everything. Let's let us know the complete quantum state of the universe. And if you believe this story, then there's these multiple branchings and everything that had a non-zero chance of happening 
actually does come true, just in different universes for all intents and purposes. And if I can rephrase the question you're asking, why in the world would anyone believe that, right? Yeah. So the answer is that it is the simplest, purest, most parsimonious way of making sense of the data. And to bolster that claim, to sort of see why you would get there, you have to know just a little bit about quantum mechanics. So think about what quantum mechanics says is that there's a difference between what is, how we talk about the world, how we you know, attach mathematically rigorous uh, quantifications of the state of the world to actualities versus what the world looks like when we look at it, okay? And looking at it isn't anything weird about consciousness or human brain or anything like that. It, a, a video camera or a rock can look at things just as well. But, th and that's, so that's just any version of quantum mechanics. Any version of quantum mecha mechanics says we describe the world differently when we are and are not looking at it. Mm. So how do you make the most parsimonious sense of that? We say that if you have an electron, for example, a little particle that is spinning, and if you measure it, whether it's spinning, given some axis, is it spinning clockwise or counterclockwise? So it's the only possibilities, one of the wonderful simplifications of quantum mechanics. It's never in between. If you measure it a certain way, it's clockwise or counterclockwise, that's it. Various reasons why, which we could go into, convince us that when we're not looking at it, the right way to talk about the electron is as a superposition of spinning clockwise and spinning counterclockwise. Right. So it's not that we don't know, it's that it's in some sense doing both with sort of different amounts of admixture of clockwise mm -hmm. and counterclockwise. And then when you look at it, you only ever see it do one or the other, okay? Mm -hmm. So the question is what happened <laughs> when we looked at it to make it go away? Well, we have an equation, right, the Schrodinger equation, which tells us what happened. And what the equation tells us is that before you looked at it, there was an electron that was in some mixture of clockwise and counterclockwise, and there was you, and you hadn't looked at it yet. And after you looked at it, there were two things. There was the electron was spinning clockwise, and you saw it spinning clockwise, and there was the electron was spinning counterclockwise, and you saw it spinning counterclockwise. That is the straightforward, unambiguous result of the equation. The question is, what do you do about that? And from 1920s to the 1950s, the answer was you panic. Mm. And you say, well, I only saw it spin counterclockwise or clockwise, so the other possibility magically disappears. And this is called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and I'm being very unfair to it, but we're among friends. So it was in 1957 that a smart graduate student named Hugh Everett said, I have a better idea. Rather than magically getting rid of it, let's just admit that it's there because that's what the equation says. What would be wrong with that? And people say, well, we only see one or the other. And, and Everett said, yeah, but now there's two of you. There's one that saw one and one that saw the other one. Mm. And they kicked him out of the field. <laughs> he left physics entirely because they wouldn't talk to him anymore. But this is the birth of what we call the many worlds interpretation. In, in this universe, they kicked in him out. In this universe, we that. kicked him out. Yeah, he's the king yeah. of physics in some other branch of the wave function. Yeah. Um, but the point is that it is, in terms of ideas and mathematical concepts, you cannot get simpler and more parsimonious than the many worlds interpretation. In terms of universes, it's messy, but how should we judge it? I would go on the basis of concepts, not on the basis of universes. Right. And then what has happened? So I want to bring in the, this notion of time because you've focused on the, on the arrow of time and, and why time seems to be a, as strange a phenomenon as it is. But there's this notion of, of a, a block universe that you don't hear much about now, which is the notion that the, the future and the past equally exist in some kind of atemporal space. That you know, it's, it's like we're all living in a novel and we're living on page 45 now, but page 95 exists just as much as the page we're on and right. you know, could be visited, uh, presumably. Just um, wait. Exactly, yeah. Is the block universe a, a retired concept, or, or are we still thinking in no, terms of the block universe? No, it's the conventional universe? wisdom. It is, okay. Yeah. But taken as a block, there is no such thing as process or an event or causality, isn't there? There's, there's, there's just this overarching pattern that is the block, right? Well, there are events. There are events scattered through the block. 
Um, it's a different way of thinking. It's, it's counterintuitive. I mean, but it's, you, like, it's like a giant noun rather than a, a giant verb. If you think of in terms of time and events and process, you, you're thinking in terms of a, a verb. Verbs but, are relative, and this is actually right. it's closely related. Everett's PhD thesis was called the relative state version of quantum mechanics, for kind of this kind of reason. You know, now is just a way of talking about my relationship to other moments of time that are equally real. They don't exist now, but they exist in the sort of whole four-dimensional block version universe of reality. And the only reason to do this is because, again, it's the simplest, most straightforward reading of the equations. The equations that we, as far as we best know them right now, of fundamental physics don't distinguish between yesterday, today, and tomorrow. They're just different numbers on a line. And both the block universe view and the many worlds view come from this philosophy that, you know, you mentioned before, you sort of gave the game away that these pictures are very counterintuitive. And the philosophy is, well, sure, they're counterintuitive. Like, why should our intuitions, developed over some number of years of evolutionary time, teach us anything at all about relativity, cosmology, or quantum mechanics? Like, it would be very surprising if our best view of the fundamental nature of reality was not highly, highly counterintuitive. And in that situation, I would argue, the best thing we can do is take the equations seriously. And that leads us to the block universe and to many worlds. Okay, so then why does time seem to flow the way it does? And how do you think about the future being different from the past? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, we don't know the entire answer to that. Um, Half of the answer is the, the physical answer as to why the past seems different from the future is because of entropy, right? Entropy is physicists' way of talking about the messiness, the disorderliness, the disorganization of a physical system, and entropy tends to increase in closed systems over time. So if you take cream and coffee, mix them together, they become higher entropy as time goes on. It's very easy to mix them together. It's very hard to unmix them. If you have cream mixed in with coffee, it would be very, very difficult to lower their entropy. It can be done, but only by increasing the entropy of the universe somewhere else. So the amazing thing is that this simple, definite feature of the universe, which is enshrined in the second law of thermodynamics, entropy increases, we would claim that underlies every single difference that we notice between the past and future. So the fact that we were born as little babies and will die as older people, the fact that we remember what happened yesterday but do not remember tomorrow, the fact that we have free will about making choices today that can affect what happens tomorrow, the way that I put it sometimes is you all could choose right now to get up and leave, right? That is something you could do because in some sense to you the future is open. You could not choose to not have come here already. Where does that asymmetry come from? There's a long song and dance, but ultimately the answer is because entropy was lower in the past. How that works psychologically is more of a neuroscience problem, actually, than a physics problem. We carry around in our brain little memories of what just happened as well as little projections of what will happen, and we're constantly updating these on the basis of new information, and that gives us this sense of an impulse or a flow, even though all the... To, to a physicist, all of those moments of time are equally real. Right. Well, so you, you mentioned free will, which is getting us closer to areas of interest and potential disagreement. Although I don't think Have we... Have thought about that? Yes, yeah, so a little, little uh, bit. A little yeah. bit. Uh, but I, I, I actually I don't think we disagree about the core claim, which is the, the free will that most people think they have, this, this right. notion that you, you could have done otherwise. Neither of us believe in that. There's the, the physics of things. If, if you could rewind the universe to precisely the state it was in when everyone decided to come here, everyone would still decide to come here helplessly a trillion times in a row, for, for better or worse. For, yeah, yeah. You know, they might be yeah. rethinking it now. Yeah. I would put a little footnote, because whenever you say could not have been different, you have to say given what. So if you were Laplace's demon, if you were, like you, like you correctly said, if you ab absolutely knew everything about the physical state of the universe, then it would have, given the uncertainties due to quantum mechanics, for putting that aside for a second, but otherwise, yes, it would have, according to the laws of physics, played out in exactly the same way. But 
as we footnoted before, there are other ways of describing the universe, emergent higher level ways where you're not Laplace's demon, where you can say, given what we actually know about the physical situation at some earlier time, what could have happened? And there you still might get some probability distribution over what could have happened, and the answers might have been different. Well, so you're saying that it's a lack of information yes. that carves out a space for free will? Yeah, absolutely. So, but is it, it's, it's that a puppet is free as long as it can't see its strings? What would it mean to actually see the proximate cause of the thing that is effective? Well, moment. I think that it would mean that you would have to be Laplace's demon, that you would really have to. So the, the idea of these emergent theories is you throw away a lot of the information that Laplace's demon would have, yet you still retain some of the predictive power. And in fact, like, like, I, like I really like to emphasize, this is a very unusual, special quasi-magical situation when that happens. Typically in physics, if you give me some information about the air in this room, right? if you give me the position and velocity of every molecule of air, and you pick out one molecule and say, how is it going to move? Mm. Right? So Laplace's demon has no trouble telling you exactly what it's going to do. But if then you say, OK, I only tell you the position and velocity of half of the air molecules, Laplace's demon has no idea where this one's going to go because it's right. going to be hit by the ones you don't know about. You, that's the generic case in physics. You throw away a little bit of the data, you lose all predictive power. Emergence is this wonderful exception to that rule where you throw away almost all of the data and keep an amazing amount of predictive power. So if you want to talk about the motion of the Earth around the sun, you don't need to talk about the position and velocity of every atom in the Earth. Right. Right? You just need to know the center of mass. And that is an enormous saving of information, and you still get quite good predictive power. So when it comes to things like human beings, what the best emergent theory that we have necessarily has probabilities built into it. We don't have a deterministic way of talking about human beings given the information we have about them. That's why I would argue it's useful to talk about free will. Well, the thing is, but adding probability to it or chance or randomness doesn't give people the freedom they think they have either. So if I told you that you might have done differently had someone roll the dice in your head and it would have produced a different synaptic outcome, that's not what people feel they have as the authors of their actions. So the, the libertarian sense is there's no upstream proximate cause of my decision, but for me making the decision. The fact that it gets made by a deterministic universe or a deterministic universe plus probabilities that I didn't have a hand in either, that isn't the feeling that gets carried forward in, in consciousness in each moment. Yeah, so I, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in this because this is the sort of the definitional morass that uh, becomes less interesting. So I think people think different things about what they have in terms of free will. Neither one of us believes in libertarian free will in any possible sense. If you were Laplace's demon, you would be determined 100%. The way that I like to put it is, um, if you didn't believe that, if you believe that even if we knew everything about your atoms and molecules, there's still something extra that makes me able to affect my motions open and over and above that, then here's a simple experiment. Jump out of the window of a tall building and use your free will to change the motion of your center of mass. <laughs> no one thinks they can do that, right? They think they can use their libertarian free will to change their hands, well, yeah, but I not mean, their center of mass. But the truth is you, you don't even have to engage any kind of suicidal experiment like that. You can just, I mean, I invite you all to just try not to hear the sound of my voice right now. Use your free will not to hear me say these words. Use your free will not to understand them. You know, like you, you speak English. You're helplessly decoding the meaning of these sounds. There's not a person in this room who can stop doing this right now, right? So that if your freedom doesn't extend to even that. Sure, that's you know, right. right. Happily, no one has taken me up on the dare that I have yeah. suggested to them. Um, but, but there are other aspects to free will. And this is why I don't even like using the term free will. As a, as a compatibilist, I, I'm sort of regretful that free will is the label that has been given to the thing we argue about. Because neither you nor I nor Daniel Dennett or, or any of our friends at this level think that there is some magical spark that lets us overcome the law of physics, right? The question is, is there a, the question to me is, 
can we describe, what is the best possible way we have of describing how human beings behave? That's the question. As far as I can tell, the best emergent effective theory we have of human beings is one that inevitably involves them being agents that make choices. Certainly, I think, and we can argue about this too, if we want to discuss things in a vocabulary of morals and oughts and responsibilities, we need to imagine that human beings make choices. And also empirically, I think that when I go to the restaurant, I do make choices. So if someday we come up with a better description a description of human beings that given the same data we have about them, lets us describe what they will do with better accuracy, then I will totally give up on any connection or commitment I have to the idea of free will. I just don't see that theory yet. Practically speaking, it's not that the best way to order food in a restaurant will be to scan your brain to figure out what you're going to order. It would be the easier thing is just to order. But the order still comes from somewhere, which we know that if we were paying attention to what's happening at the level of the brain, it is happening there and is determining the choice you make even while you still think you're making up your mind, the you, the conscious witness of your experience. And we know that's the case. And that is undermining of what people feel they have. And the reason why I think this is important and not just a merely academic conversation is that I think this does begin to have ethical implications when you think about the possibility of just understanding the human mind more and more deeply. So we, we have this category of human misbehavior that we call evil now. So we, there's evil people in the world that they do terrible things that we have to figure out some way to prevent. But the physicist in you must see them, I presume, on some level as malfunctioning robots, right? I mean, they're part of this concatenation of events that's ultimately describable in terms of physics. And if there was some way of understanding evil at the level of the brain, there would be a more complete description of it there. And if there were a way to remedy it, right? If there were a cure for evil, if there were a pill that could cure a psychopathy, say, I mean, to just take one band on the spectrum of evil. So we have these, these people who we diagnose with psychopathy. And that we, we sort of dimly understand anomalies in the brain that correlate with, with that condition, conditions of low empathy and all the rest, and a, a disposition to use instrumental violence. If we understood that perfectly and could intrude in the brain in a way that was harmless and just change them. And so every time you gave a psychopath this pill, he promptly apologized for everything he had done and said, I just, I'm, I'm such a relief. I was such a bad person, and now I'm just horrified, and you know, thank you for this cure. Uh, and he, then, he, then he lived every day of his life as morally healthy as any normal person. We would cease to have this category of evil. We would just cure people. We, and so we certainly wouldn't have a retributive justice system that punished people as the, because they were the true deserving authors of their actions who deserved to suffer for all that they had done. They, these, on some level, we would recognize them to be casualties of bad biology, which we now have a remedy for. Short of getting that remedy the door is already open to a, uh, viewing even evil people as, on some basic level, unlucky inheritors of bad biology or a bad mixture of biology and environment or what you, just whatever concatenation of causes makes them how they are. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot going on there. I think that um, I completely agree that thinking clearly and scientifically about where people's motivations and uh, the causality behind their actions come from uh, will have enormous repercussions for uh, how we think about responsibility, how we do criminal justice, how we uh, do morals and ethics more generally, right? Uh, and I think that advances in neuroscience and psychotherapy of various reason, of various ways or, or alterations to the brain could very well have these enormous ethical implications, which I don't have strong feelings about what they are, but I totally agree that we should start thinking about them, and that's very important. Um, I don't really think that it gets at the, the point that I want to make about how we think about the effective theory of human beings as emergent phenomena. I think that if you imagine, uh, I think that what you're doing by imagining looking into the brain and seeing what someone is going to do and saying that changes our understanding of their responsibility for their own actions, to me, that's, that's fine, 
but you're, you're not changing our best theory of human beings. You just have a theory of a lower level. You know, Plato would have said that there is something called the platonic form of a chair, and this chair participates in that form. And today, we know that's not true. The chair is made of atoms, okay? It's a particular shape of atoms. But we don't say, therefore, there is not a chair, right? Therefore, the chair went away. There's a description of the chair as a chair, the level that we describe it as chairs, and there's another level below where we describe it as a collection of atoms. I see no incompatibility with saying that there is a way of describing human beings, which is the best way we have given the data and information we have about human beings in our everyday lives, which describes them as agents capable of making choices, and also that if we knew more about the microprocesses in their brain, we would use a different vocabulary for describing what they do. Right. You don't see an ethical implication to the recognition that if you were exactly in the place of the person who's behaving badly, you would be that person behaving badly? So that means you're, you're lucky not to be Saddam Hussein or some bad person. If you had his brain and his life circumstance, you would be precisely that person. That there's no, there are no degrees of freedom <laughs> apart from whatever randomness you want to throw into the system to avoid being that person. Yeah, I think that, that those sentences literally do not make sense. The sentence is, uh, if I were Saddam Hussein. Well, no, I understand that yeah, something gets lost there because there's, there's no you carried over from... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think that kind of matters in this case. Yes. Well, it, well it, do, you, do you feel you can take credit for being who you are? Part of it. What part? Uh, you know, I decided to get a PhD. You, you, you did? I did. You did. <laughs> and but c can you explain... You did too. Well, no, because see, I mean, this is the problem I have in these conversations because like, my experience is actually compatible with what we're calling determinism or determinism plus randomness. So like, I, when I look at how decisions get made, I experience a fundamental mystery in each moment around just what becomes effective. So the decision to, you know, if, you know, I see a list of topics here that I can choose, right? Now, if I skip over one and go to the next one, that, quote, decision is always mysterious on some level. It's like I can have some story, you know, post hoc story about why I did it in that case. But that always strikes me as post hoc. And even if the story is accurate, even if I said, oh, we, we don't need to talk about that because I talked about that on my last podcast, the fact that that memory arose in that moment is mysterious. The fact that it was effective in the way that it was is mysterious. The fact that it didn't have a, the opposite effect is mysterious. It could have just, I, I could have said, oh, well, I, I talked about that in my last podcast, but Sean's the perfect person for me to bounce that off of. So everything there is compatible with determinism. So I, in, in this case, I do actually feel like it's possible to see the strings. Then the puppetry is no longer an affront to our, our, our subjectivity. It's just, it actually is bringing our subjectivity more in line with what we have every reason to believe that data are. Right. So the way I would disagree with this analysis, I think, it's, I think that what you're saying is related, although at the end of the day, different, to um, an argument that John Searle gave in favor of free will. The argument, it was just a joke. It was literally, he was supposed to be a joke. And he said, look, if I really didn't believe in free will, when I went to a restaurant and the waiter says, what would you like to eat? All I should ever say is, just give me whatever the laws of physics determined I will have, right? And of course, no one does that. And Searle concludes from that, we must have free will because, you know, we don't really act like that. But I think that that's a misunderstanding in the sense that it's a mixing of levels. I think that what you're, the tension that you're pointing at comes from, on the one hand, we have this way of talking about human beings as agents making choices. At the other hand, we also have a different, slightly lower level description of brains, and there are different parts of the brain, and they're talking to each other, and there are subconscious things going on, and we have histories that, you know, led us to certain places that we didn't control. And all that is also true, but it's compatible in my mind with the existence of another layer where we can talk about human beings as people making choices. It's just that it's a different way of talking about the same stuff. It's not incompatible ways. Yeah, so I, I fully agree that we can talk in a conventional sense about choices and, and the proximate cause of doing something 
is rather often choosing to do that thing. But if you actually drill down on what a choice is, you are once again laid bare to this stream of causes which you, the witness of each conscious moment, haven't authored. Well, right and, up and, until and, that last clause, I was going to totally agree and say we should declare victory. Right, but right, the, right. The, uh, I, I think that the, up until that last clause, I thought the thing that you were laying out uh, that there are two different ways of talking about human beings. I guess my question is, do you feel that your experience is compatible with, let's just say that determinism is true yeah. and provably so, so that, you know, we could have the people in, in with the right scanners backstage actually anticipating everything we're going to say before we say it. So we could just right. see a printout of everything we said here before it could possibly have been recorded, say, or there's some way of proving to us that we are mere puppets. Is your conscious experience compatible with that? fact or sure. not okay so that's not yeah. an affront to for the fact that everything you said tonight could have been predicted absolutely uh, right. it's, it's fine it, it, that, that maps onto your experience it could have been predicted by the imaginary laplace's demon in the back room it couldn't have been predicted by me yes and so 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 i mean and i think i think it was max planck who had that construal of free will that was basically it's just it's not a claim about the physics of things. It's a claim about the psychology of being a person. The fact that you have incomplete information about what you are going to do always makes it seem like you are the free author of your thoughts and actions. It's a psychological claim about what it's like to have incomplete information about your own physics. Well, we're getting very, very narrow here, but it's not quite, to me, a psychological claim. It is, again, a claim about what is the best way of talking about human beings at this level of description. And the way that it sounds wrong is when you use words that should only be used in the vocabulary of human beings making choices, like you or yourself, and you translate them down into the layer that is more imaginary, where we have a lot more data, where you say, you are the author of all these influences, or you know, how could you be affecting all these things that you didn't even know were happening? But you're not allowed to talk that way. You're allowed to talk about you as a person, talking to other people, making choices, or you're allowed to talk about brains being influenced by things, but not both at the same time. And you don't see a way in which those two levels will come into tension when we have a greater understanding and more predictive power of the base level. I mean, it is just a thought experiment to think of Laplace's demon right. backstage, but more and more, if you began to feel that your, you know, if your smartphone knew so much about you that you are now just being played by it, I mean, it's like it, it seems to almost be endowed with the power of telepathy because yeah. it can anticipate everything you're about to think. It's completing your sentences for you. Wouldn't that begin to put tension here between what people think they are and what... It totally would. I'd be 100% open to that, which is a rephrasing of what I think maybe I said earlier. If we had a better theory of human beings and, and how to describe them based on the same information that we actually have about them, and in that theory, we did not talk about human beings as agents making choices or volition or, or free will, then that would be better and we would get rid of that notion completely. Right. All right, well, so let's drive to the area that I think more concerns me, and it is the area we've disagreed about in the past, which is the, the status of things like values and claims of right and wrong and good and evil, the ethics in, in the natural order. You have made much of this notion that you've derived from, from Hume that you can't get an ought from an is. But perhaps you want to you prop that up. Like I, in the past, in my book, The Moral Landscape, and in... I think it was the, the TED talk I gave that you reacted to way back when. It was 2010. I claim to... Oh my God, was it 2010? Really? 2010, <laughs> yes. That's how quickly time All flies. Right. So I claim that we, you can make ultimately rigorous scientific claims about right and wrong and good and evil. And I was arguing for a kind of what I would call a moral realism, which is to say that there are facts about the well-being of conscious creatures, which, is, which can serve everything we could conceivably mean by right and wrong and good and evil. And these are naturalistic facts, and you can be right and wrong about them. And realism, in, in this sense, is the fact that there is a reality, whether you understand it or not. Your claims about it can be more or less right or wrong. It's possible not to know what you're missing. And I extend that to the domain of questions of value, right? And you, 
are, are a fan of Hume's parsing of this matter. So perhaps give give me the reasons why not from the Hume side, and then we can. Sure, I think that there's two slightly different claims. Um, one would be the claim that you can derive ought from is, which I think is just manifestly wrong. Uh, very that's, that's just logically wrong, right? In by the rules of logic, garbage in, garbage out. Values in, values out, facts in, facts out. By using the rules of deductive logic, you cannot derive conclusions about properties that did not somehow appear in the axioms or the premises from which you did your logic. Uh, so I think that's just a non-starter. Now, just to unpack that a little more. So yeah. the, the claim, Hume's claim was that there's no description of the way the world is. There's no f factual description of the universe which can tell you how it ought to be or how you should act within it, right? So it's, it's the, the oughts and shoulds get smuggled in. You have to add something that you want. You have to have, add a goal, say, and then on your account, science can tell you how to reach that goal. But the goal is something that you, the value-laden goal is something that you are smuggling in. That's right. So Hume, you know, I feel bad because, uh, Late in life, I realized that Hume should have been my hero all along. One of the very few shortcomings of my philosophical undergraduate education was that I was at a Catholic university, and Hume was the bad guy. So I didn't realize until much later that Hume was the good guy. Um, and however, bless his heart, he was not the clearest writer all the time. And he was the clearest thinker, but he was also mischievous. So he would make his points via dialogue or sarcasm or jokes. <laughs> and the is and ought uh, analysis is exactly that. He's, he's, it, it's not his you know, most definitive, careful, logical piece of writing, because basically he's making fun of people who he thinks are making this mistake. He says, I'm, I'm reading people writing about what is true and is true. And that, yeah, that's what he was aiming at. And then suddenly it's about what ought to be true, and it didn't come from anywhere. And so he kind of implies that you can't do it. And so I think that's right. I think that uh, the, the conclusion, I would, in that case, I would believe the strong conclusion, namely that in order to derive conclusions about what ought to be true or what should be true or what is morally right, we have to include in our theory an assumption or an axiom that relates to values, that relates to what is good and what, what ought to do. I think that is a straightforward computational science claim, that you can't do the logic from there. Now, even if you believe that claim, which everyone should believe, um, you could still argue about moral realism versus anti-realism. It's totally possible to be a moral realist and a moral objectivist and still admit that you can't derive a lot from it. Yeah, so I've always viewed that little bit of Hume, and again, it is kind of an aside. It's not something he argues for at length, and yet people have made much of it in philosophy and in science. I viewed it as a kind of semantic trick which need not confine our thinking about these things. It's a little bit like Zeno's paradox. Zeno says, you know, in order for an arrow to hit its target, it must move halfway to the target and then halfway again and halfway again, and there, ergo it never arrives. But of course, arrows don't have to fly that way. Arrows can just fly all the way to the target. And if you want to add, if you need mathematics where you sum the infinite series or you do find some way of nullifying that argument, fine. But it's set up as a, and it took hundreds of years for people to figure out why it's wrong, but it is just, it's an unnatural constraint imposed by, in that case, just the, the geometry of the situation. In Hume's case, it's just the meaning we're giving words like ought and should versus is. Now, I think, so let's, the other way to, to come at it from my point of view is you can give up all notion of ought and should. Let's say you, we're, we're in the universe and there is no ought or should, or let, let's discover the oughts and shoulds. I mean, one, one question I have, which doesn't originate with me, I think many people have posed it this way, but if, if all the facts, if all the is claims in the universe aren't enough to give you some guidance as to how you ought to live, just what could give you that guidance, right? I mean, we're talking about the totality That's of That's in my facts. book. Yes, yes. So <laughs> I, I think Dan Dennett has made this point and, and others have. So that's worth wondering, right? It's like what, what extra piece you know, could, would you be hoping for? But let's say there's no such thing as ought or should, or let's start there. It seems pretty clear to me that the ground truth of our circumstance as conscious beings is first consciousness. The, the, the something seems to be happening where there's an experiential character to this place. And this experience 
admits of a range of possibilities that we are, you know, we have all dimly discovered parts of this range. We, we have had excruciating experiences and sublimely happy experiences, and we are trying to navigate toward the latter and away from the former, and helplessly trying. It's like, this is, the values come in, put your hand on a hot stove, you will discover your value to get your hand off of it very early. You don't have to be reasoned into it. This is as incontrovertible as anything you can experience. There are certain things that you will just want to avoid. And so to take a more abstract picture, there is consciousness. There is the totality of actual and possible conscious minds that are open to this range of conscious experience. And the only thing I think I need to be a moral realist and for science ultimately to be the framework in which we talk about right and wrong and good and evil is to concede that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad, right? If, any, if we should avoid anything, if we should do anything, we should get away from the worst possible misery for everyone. Every other state of the universe is better than that. If words like good and bad and better and worse are going to mean anything ever, having every possible conscious mind suffer as much as it possibly can for as long as it can to no good end, where there's no silver lining, there's no lessons learned, this is just hell, right? That's bad and worth avoiding. And the answers as to how the minds involved would avoid this state are all ultimately scientific. We were talking, I mean, in our case, we're talking about everything from genes on up to economic systems. We're talking about neurochemistry, we're talking about psychology, sociology, politics, whatever fact based discussion we can have about how creatures like ourselves can flourish. That, and again, this is a, you and I may define science slightly differently. I'm not talking about you know, narrowly operationalized, lab-coded science, or I'm not talking about the equations we can write now to describe these systems. I'm not talking about data we necessarily can get right now with the machines available. But a fact-based discussion about all of the variables that spell the difference between excruciating and pointless misery on the one hand and sublimely creative, beautiful, joyful, as good as it gets, conscious states on the other. And again, we, do, we don't know how far the horizons go in both directions. And this is why this is realism. Undoubtedly, there are horizons of conscious experience that we will never even imagine exist, but are possible for minds very different from our own. And we may one day build the artificial intelligences that experience those states, if in fact we, we build conscious machines. So... All of this is a discussion about facts, actual facts and possible facts, known and unknown, that relate to the conscious experience of conscious beings. And it captures every possibility of suffering and happiness within it, because these are natural phenomena. We're told consciousness is a natural phenomenon, and its, and its contents must be natural phenomena. And if you can't find your morality and your claims of good and evil and right and wrong and better and worse there, there's nowhere else to find them. This is, this is the space in which things can possibly matter. This is where values can be found. That's why I put, ultimately, whether we can in practice in any given moment do this, ultimately, the questions of value fall within that naturalistic paradigm. Previous conversations between us online suggest that you demur there and we disagree, but I'm not sure whether we've just been hung up on the meanings of words and the consequences of Hume or if you actually disagree. There. Well, there's, there's a, a little bit of gliding back and forth between what we call ethical questions and meta-ethical questions, right? Ethical questions on how we actually, you know, what is right and wrong, what should we do, what is moral, and the meta-ethical questions on how do we set up a system for deciding what is ethical and so forth. So you seem to say that there is a principle that we should avoid maximal suffering for conscious creatures. So do we agree that you are not deriving that principle from what is? That's an no, extra little bit of axiom? Well, no, I, I'm, I would say that like every other scientific discipline, a science of value in this sense does have to pull itself up by its bootstraps on, well, with some axiom. So, you know, physics has axioms like the value of understanding the world in a logically coherent way, or even in, even in a way that doesn't seem logically coherent, but is coherent by some other logic that we can't intuit, right? So as is the case with quantum mechanics. 
So there's some brute fact of epistemology. There's some yank of the bootstraps that has to get your inquiry started. And I actually can find nothing more fundamental from my point of view than the fact of consciousness, the fact that something seems to be happening. I mean, this is, this is compatible with us being confused about everything else, right? We, this could be a simulation. We're in the matrix. We're a brain in a vat. This is a dream. I'm the only one who exists. All of that's possible. I could be radically confused, mistaken about everything. And yet the one thing I can't be confused about, the one thing that can't be an illusion is that something seems to be happening. And that's what I'm calling consciousness. And then the only other axiom to add is that there is a difference between the worst possible state of consciousness and the best insofar as those can be discovered. If anything matters, that difference matters. That's where ethics come in. And, and so the, the reason why the meta-ethics, the only relevant meta-ethics here, and the, the meta-ethics is, I mean, the, the meta-ethical doubt you could introduce here is, and, and people do this, but I can't believe they mean what they think they mean, They'll say things like, well, who's to say that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad, right? Like, so where can you stand so as to form that doubt? Like, you know, again, I'll just take you to a hot stove and let's have this conversation, right? Like, there's something more fundamental than the, the intuition you think you have that can motivate that doubt, right? So, of course, science requires assumptions to get off the ground the basic intelligibility of the world, some rough correspondence of our sensory data with things that happen and, and so forth. Uh, morality or ethics also require assumptions to get off the ground. The point is that the assumptions you need to get morality off the ground are not a subset of the ones you need to get science off the ground. You're introducing a new assumption that we should avoid the maximum pain for conscious creatures. So well, how is that an assumption that is any less fundamental. I didn't say than, it was. Okay. It's but, just not science. But it's not science to say we should understand the world either. That's an ought that you smuggle in in order to motivate science. No, it's, no, no. It, but it's, it's, it's not medicine to say that you should cure disease. It's just once you agree that you should cure disease, you can have a science of medicine. Right. But the things we learn by doing science, let's put it this way. Uh, think about possible worlds, right? The philosopher David Lewis liked to talk in these terms. Imagine all the different ways the world could be. One way to think about what science does is to say there's all these different ways the world could be. Let's go look at it and figure which one it is. So the world, the universe could be expanding. It could be contracting. We don't know. We need to go look at it. That's how we learn what is by making these observations. Your principle that we should avoid the maximum uh, suffering for conscious creatures is not to be learned that way. Well, so I can, again, I think we're getting hung up on the charge nature of this word should. Let's just say there is no should, but and yet there are all of these experiences on offer. And you, from the core of your being as a conscious being, will prefer some states over others. That is a fact. That is, that is, a, that is a fact about you. Yes. That is part of the is. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And science can understand that ultimately. Yes. Right? And what we have, therefore, is this navigation problem. You care whether you burn in fire for eternity. I do. And, and that's, it's in the nature. And if there is a state where that happens, science subsumes that fact. Right. Right. And if there's a way to avoid that, science, some completed science, subsumes that fact. Yes. And so, so in my view, these claims about what's possible for conscious minds captures every, everything we could conceivably care about. But you, for some reason, which I'm a little confused to about, should to, to this picture. You the, the navigation do. problem still exists. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. I'm yeah. just, it is a should claim. It is, you know, you, there are things that will happen in the world. There are different ways that things could happen, and they would be associated with different levels of suffering. And that's it. And we stop, right? If all we're doing is science, we're describing what happens in the world or what could happen, and we stop. But 
to do anything about morality. Morality is necessarily a set of statements about what we ought to do, what should happen, what is right and wrong. Well, no, and it, all it, we it, need it, to it do just, is admit just... one more axiom that we should avoid the greatest suffering and we can't derive it from what is, and then we can stop talking about meta-ethics and talk about ethics. First of all, you, you're not, I don't think you're acknowledging all of the mad work done by people who think that you can't actually make universal claims, realistic claims about right and wrong, good and evil. So it's like they, well, they, I didn't they, they, agree they, with your axiom. Yeah. I just want you to admit that it's an axiom. Well, my claim is that you can get there with just is claims about the situation we're in. We all will have this preference not to burn in fire for eternity. Right? So that, what? That, that's, that's of the nature of uh, what it is to be a conscious being and the difference between burning in fire and not, right? And there are right answers with respect to how to avoid that. So this is a, just a description of the situation. Do I want to avoid it? Yeah. Should I? No, no. But you want to avoid it, and there's a way to avoid it. That, but that... should I avoid it? Should you avoid it? Should I make other people avoid it? But the, the should is derivable from the feeling of how bad it is to be in fire for eternity. If we assume that we should avoid the feeling of being in fire for all eternity. But, but my, what I'm saying is that the, the claim, the question, the place that it, it seems be like... It very liberating for you to just say, yes, we should assume that. <laughs> well, but I'm, I just don't see, there, there's no alternative. Well, like, if you actually... If there's no alternative, then we should certainly do it. But I, it's, not, it's, not e- it's not even an operation. That, that's what I'm saying. If there's no alternative, the gesture is, it, it can't even be made. So... If, if you're actually tracking what is meant by the words, the worst possible misery for everyone, there's no place to stand where you could say, well, should we really avoid that? Maybe, there, maybe we have other priorities. Maybe there's something more important than avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone. You really don't want to just admit, I mean, I, no, I, I could I, certainly... Yeah. Imagine all sorts of alternative what, what, axioms. Imagine another priority. We should maximize the suffering of conscious creatures. But, but, but who, are we? who are we in that case? We are among the conscious creatures. Yeah, we should, yeah. Uh, I, again, I'm not, that. there's an ethical question about whether or not this is the right axiom to choose. But there is a perfectly transparent, logical question about do we need such an axiom? Well, no, I, I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, this is one of these conversations where, at some level, all you can appeal to are your intuitions about the kind of the meanings of words, like "should" or but I think or, no, I, or what I, it means to embrace an axiom. I disagree. I think that, uh, and again, the, the the example I do in the book came from John Searle, who I picked on a lot. Um, uh, but he did the same kind of thing you're doing, the same kind of thing I would argue David Hume was arguing against. He said, he wrote a paper entitled, How to Derive Ought from Is. And he started with something like, I say a certain sentence, a clear is statement. And then he just sort of translated that sentence very gradually. And at the end, he said, yeah, I ought to act this yeah, way. No, no, I, I agree that Searle's maneuver there smuggled in, the, but he was playing by Hume's rules, right? I, I, I think there's something more fundamental than the rules Hume set up. That's what if I'm trying to get For whatever at. reason, you are reluctant to admit that you are uh, assuming that we should not maximize the suffering of conscious creatures, then all you can do is say, here are some things that could happen, and here is the suffering that would be attached to them. But to say that is to pretend to stand somewhere outside that system where there's nothing else that ma- could conceivably matter more than the thing you're describing, right? So like the mattering comes in. The mattering is not a, a layer you, you apply to it after the fact. You certainly don't want to take the epistemological stance that what should and should not happen is really just achievable by definition. I think there is substance to choosing between different standpoints from which to get morality. And I think that this is, this is the, the reason why this conversation is sort of, I mean, it's an important conversation to have. I'm all in favor of having it. But it's frustrating because it's 5% of the conversation we should have. Because if we could admit that one makes an assumption to get morality off the ground, just like one makes science that, assumptions. That, that's a, I've always admitted that in the sense that, that that is the, every scientific enterprise, every foundational enterprise does have this brute fact 
pull yourself by the bootstraps maneuver and sci- every and so and the the thing I've always been railing against is this apparent double standard where people ask of a universal morality something they would never ask of physics physics isn't self-justifying no they don't they re- they're really not well they, they're just well, they pointing do, out because i've been on the other side of those the, conversations the, they're pointing out that this extra thing you need is not subsumed within the things you already have this extra axiom to get morality off the ground is not one of the axioms well, we need to get science off the ground admit it it's okay it, it's not it's, you'll be happier you it, should do it yes very good point minimize the suffering of these <laughs> I would agree with you that all the interesting work of ethics is yet to be done once yes. you admit this so the reason why in my view the, there's a landscape of possibilities here there could be many right answers and many more wrong answers to how to live a good life and and these right answers can be incompatible and so we could have yep. we, we could have genuine disagreements about what a good life looks like given you know, how we're set up culturally or, or, or psychologically. Well, I think, I think we've, I will, I will leave it to the wisdom of the crowd to figure out what we agree about or disagree about there. Um, before I go to, to uh, q and A, I'd I'd like to hit you with some rapid fire kind of bonus questions. That, All right. That, bonus that, round. That, that, that take us in very different areas. If you had one piece of advice for someone who wanted to succeed in your field, what would that be? I'm not sure I've succeeded in my field yet, so uh, I might not be the right person to ask. But um, given if you're a young person who imagines that what they might want to do for a living is science, and you're still young enough to make those choices, etc., cetera, um, in this day and age, the single biggest advice I would give is to not wait for things to happen to you in the sense of, and because I did, all, I, all of my advice comes from remembering what I did wrong and then telling people not to do it. So like I wouldn't learn things until I could take a class that taught them to me. And these days you can just go home tonight and start, sign up for a class from MIT that teaches you quantum field theory if you want to do that. Uh, don't wait to read the most recent research papers. If you've, if you've taken the right classes and you've gotten up there, then don't wait for your professors to assign you things. Go start reading them. Wonder how you could do better. Start your own little simulations. Do your own research projects. Take the initiative. You will fail, right? You will fall on your face. You will make terrible mistakes. Hopefully you will get guidance that will help you. But the hardest transition I see in students going from high school to college to graduate school to postdoc is that at some point you stop being a student and you start being a scientist. And it's a completely different skill set that we've not trained you for. So my advice is to start acting like a scientist as soon as possible, which means ask your own questions, try to answer them. So perhaps a related question, what do you wish you had done differently in your 20s or 30s or 40s so you can you can pick the relevant decade there but what would I you mean where to start yeah. um yeah i mean in some sense and i think this is true for many people i wish i had thought bigger you know you come into um graduate school so the way to become a professional scientist the, the usual track undergraduate four-year bachelor's five years phd you spend a couple of postdoctoral positions for three or so years doing research before you eventually become a faculty member. And um, when you start graduate school, typically you're not able to do anything as a scientist, right? You might have dabbled in some research as an undergraduate, but you're not able to start your own lab or whatever. Uh, as a theorist, you're, you just don't have the requisite background tools. And by the time you finish graduate school, you're now working as a scientist, you're able to do things. Um, so you go from being able to do zero things to being able to do one thing. And there's a tremendous temptation to do that thing for the next 50 years, right? Because that's the thing you've worked hard to learn to do. But it might not be the thing that is most interesting or important to do. And kind of embarrassingly for me, I remember literally sitting at dinner when I was a postdoc with a visiting scientist and we were chit-chatting and he just said, you know, um, I mean, I, I assume everyone here at this table thinks that whatever they're doing right now is the most important thing to be done. 
And I thought to myself, oof, that's not really true. I don't. I don't. It's what I can do, and I, you know, I'm kind of having fun doing it, but is it the most important thing to be done? Maybe not. So it's really only in the last five years that in my own mind I've, I've switched my research focus to doing what I think is the most important thing. So 10 years from now, looking back on this decade, what do you think you'll regret doing too much of? Right or, now? Yeah, or too, too little of. <sighs> I will resist the temptation to say, you know, podcasts or Twitter or anything like that. Um, no, come on. If I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be doing it. That's highly... Uh, well, no, but that assumes you would be perfectly motivated to do what you know is right to do. I might be trying to... I know, I know. I'm, you're right, you're right. You got yeah, me. This, um, is, this is a... I mean, I suspect... It's called acrasia. <laughs> my, yeah, my it's sort the Greek of, for that, this problem, which is a weakness of will. Right. My anticipatory regret, what I suspect I will regret, is that... Um, I didn't quite tackle all of the crazy different things that I would love to someday do. Haven't written my screenplay yet or my novel, right? Uh, you know, haven't learned meditation at a, at a serious level. Uh, haven't spent a year in France or India or something like that. There's a million things I would love to do and I haven't done yet. And, you know, in my brain, I'm doing these over the next 10 years, but we'll see if that actually happens. What negative experience one that you would not wish to repeat has most changed you for the better? For the better. Silver lining, but it was truly negative and you wouldn't I think that's a myth. I think all the negative experiences have been bad. Um, really? No, no wisdom? No growth? I'm not no? sure. That's interesting. Um, let me think about that one. Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm that sure. Will, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, I, was that just a, a, a flippant line, or is that actually your intuition that that a truly negative experience has no upside? The first thing that comes to mind about the negative experiences is, you know, those bastards. I'm not going to give them any credit for doing that bad thing to me by saying that it was secretly good. No. Right. right. <laughs> uh, this is for you, Sam. Um, one of the things I've appreciated about you is is you're hated by so many different people from so many sides of the political spectrum. Thank you. That's, so hats that, off to that's that. A, that's a statement I've never heard, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, w with that said, there's there's kind of a concept um, in public policy politics, um, kind of this the idea of the third way. There there's there's not this way, this way. There, there's something in in between here that we're missing. Mm -hmm. um, when you think of public policy, when you think of you know where our country is, and I, is there an idea? Is there an ethic that maybe uh, you know at times you just throw up your hands and think, hell, if we could just have this in our consideration, uh, that would really help maybe the public policy, public debate, uh, and 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 how we discuss our communities in this in this country and in the world. Well, I think it is. I mean, there there are many. And there are many that I think will be engineered for us or will engineer for ourselves just by getting incentives tuned correctly. So I, I think largely our failure is not, and, I've, and forgive me, I've said something like this many times before, but I, it just it's, keeps coming around for me again and again, is that it's not a matter of there being so many bad people in the world or even that there's so many people who want fundamentally different things out of life. What we have are coordination problems. We have, we have incentives that are badly aligned. We have people who can't agree to change their behavior at the same time in ways that would be advantageous for everyone because they can't, again, it's, it's a coordination problem. It's like there's, there's like a local maximum where people are, are stuck. I mean, this is a kind of a game theoretic problem of, of you know, Nash equilibria where it just you can't get everyone to to play a different game and a better game and a game that they would if they had more information. But certainly, mo enough of us would recognize is a better game, and all boats or most boats would rise with that tide. I mean, ultimately, it is. It's got to be a matter of ideas and better messaging and better stories and convincing enough people to change things that need to be changed. But the changes that we'll make, I think, have to be institutionalized. They have to be inscribed at the level of culture as the operating system so that mediocre people like ourselves don't have to get up every morning and be saints 
or recommit to some new heroic ethical norm that we can't quite get a purchase on as apes. We need to be incentivized as we are to effortlessly be better and, and, and cooperate better. And, and I think ultimately, I think conversation is the only tool we have. And political conversation is so broken down now that it's, it's hard to see a basis for hope there. I think it's probably not going to come through politics first. Uh, thank you so much for coming to Portland. Yes. Um, my question is for both of you. How are ideas, um, some scientific ideas, specifically quantum mechanics, misused in popular culture? And how can we appropriately use them instead? Yeah, I mean, how are they not? Quantum mechanics. Uh, it's partly our fault. When I say our, I mean professional scientists um, for two reasons. Number one, we don't put enough effort into explaining hard ideas in physics to the public. You know, there are some very famous people who do this and do it, do it very well and do it very effectively, but it is still nowhere near capacity in terms of what people want. Uh, and within academia professionally, you suffer, you're, you're hurt rather than helped by the idea that you're spending your effort doing this. And the second thing is that we are afraid of quantum mechanics. We professional scientists. Uh, I'm working on a book right now uh, that will be about quantum mechanics. And the opening line, if my editor lets me get away with it, is you don't need a PhD in theoretical physicist to be, physics to be afraid of quantum mechanics, but it doesn't hurt. We have, we have had this problem since 1920s that we don't know really what quantum mechanics says. We can use it, we have a cookbook, a black box, but we don't know what it is telling us about the nature of reality. We have different ideas, like many worlds is one such idea, but we don't have a consensus. And you would think that getting that understanding would be the single biggest priority of theoretical physics, that people who thought about this for a living would be the superstars of science. And, you know, Harvard and Princeton would be fighting to offer them bigger salaries. But instead, they are fired. They are kicked out of the field, like whoever it was. Uh, it's thought that that is not serious. You're not solving the equations. You're just thinking about the nature of reality. Uh, and so as a result, there's an opening. There's an empty space that can be filled by nonsense by people who think that quantum mechanics brings reality into existence just by thinking and things like that. So if, if there's just one little pithy bumper sticker style message that would help, it's that quantum mechanics is physics, it's not magic. Can, can you say a little bit more about why that's nonsense? Because that sounds perilously close to what was the, the granddaddy of all interpretations, the, the Copenhagen interpretation. So like, what, why was Niels Bohr not purveying nonsense, right. or, or in fact, was he? I mean, he kind of was. Yeah. Uh, Heisenberg did more nonsense than Bohr. Bohr was just impossible to understand, so it was, it was anyone could imagine that he was saying whatever they wanted. But there was, you know, so there was this abdication of responsibility in the sense that there's this thing called the measurement problem. What happens when you actually measure that quantum mechanical system? And the sort of most straightforward interpretation of, of what Bohr and Heisenberg were saying were that was that somehow the system changed instantly. And they were never very clear about whether the system physically changed or your knowledge of the system changed. But uh, the act of observation was given some special status in the Copenhagen interpretation. That's very, very clear. And even professional physicists therefore started thinking about, you know, does consciousness have a role to play in it? And these days, almost nobody thinks that um, because we have equations, we have mechanisms that can make it happen no matter what interpretation of quantum mechanics you like. But there was so, this whole period where it was, it was a matter of conscious knowledge of how the system, I mean, the, the classic example is the double slit experiment. So the conscious right. knowledge of the outcome changes the way particles behave or the way of particle duality. And... Then you had people talking about, well, then what collapses the wave of the physicist who's looking at the, at the data? Does someone have to come into the room and look at him to, yeah. to collapse him? So right. we know the answer to that. Yes. It has nothing to do with consciousness. Okay, so, but, but, but how it, is it that we spent, what was it, 50 years worrying about that unnecessarily? A, a bad incentive structure. We <laughs> didn't spend time worrying about it. We spent right. time finding out who wanted to worry about it and not letting them become professional physicists. Mm. 
And so I think it's an embarrassment. I think it's a terrible, uh, you know, I, I, again, I will say in the book, when 500 years from now, future historians of science are looking back at the 20th century, they will say it is absolutely amazing and astonishing that these people figured out quantum mechanics and an absolute tragedy and inexplicable that they didn't try to understand it. Hmm. And when you say try to understand it, try to form a realistic conception of what it looks like beyond just solving the equation. That's right. Yes. Um, in light of the problems that we see in academia, media, politics, etc., cetera, um, Brett and Eric Weinstein have put forward this idea of a game B that would be non-coercive and be emergent in our current system. I was wondering if you thought that something that drastic would be necessary or if we could reform what we have now and what that would sort of look like in your opinion? Honestly, I don't know enough about what they're imagining there to, to comment. And, you know, I'm not a fan of drastic social experiments. I mean, I think, I think we should want incremental change wherever we, we can get it. You know, it's just, it's hard to, the word drastic doesn't map on to political reality in a happy way for the most part. I've heard them make those noises, but I, I don't actually know what they uh, have discussed along those lines. But I can find out. I will bring them on the podcast to, to have that conversation if, there, if there's a conversation to be had. Hi, my name is Cameron from Walla Walla, Washington. My question is, how can a person attempt to deal with negative emotions like jealousy over your sexual partner? Yeah, it's not yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> just, well. <laughs> Listen. So, but so, if Laplace's demon yeah. were here, he would yeah. be able to tell you how to do it. But well, <laughs> I, I'm I'm reluctant to sign on the dotted line that you, that you should necessarily, right? So I'm, if you're part of some polyamory community where you're trying to work out some drastic social experiment, <laughs> I I question the the wisdom of the the enterprise. There's a certain parts of human nature that you don't necessarily want to go too much against or it's just it's just not worth trying but i would say that in the context of an ordinary healthy relationship jealousy is a toxic emotion that one does want to get over and in some you know limit cases where you imagine so you know, you imagine you're you're going to die and then what sort of life do you want for your spouse after you die well, if you're committed to the happiness of your spouse, you want him or her to have a full, rich life, which includes another relationship, very likely, right? And so it's, it's like you're not jealous of that, really, when you realize you're on the same team. And so if you're talking about jealousy in the context of you're both alive and healthy and living toward an indefinite future, and you're just noticing these moments where they declare an interest, they notice that someone else is attractive or whatever it is. This is just, this is what human minds are like. It's what your own mind is like. And it has no necessary implication that's negative for the relationship unless it does, unless you're unhappy in the relationship, unless, there's, unless it signifies something for which there is a remedy or not. But in general, jealousy is like any negative emotion in that it arises on the basis of certain thoughts and has a, ha a half-life that is incredibly short once you learn how to get out of your rumination about it and, and cease to keep kindling it with more thinking. Now, if you're, if you're captured by the storyline of your thoughts and you think, I have every reason to be jealous and here's why, and you spend the next four hours thinking about it, well, then you will feel that this is an, an uninterrupted and uninterruptible emotion that seems to have all kinds of implications. You have to say the thing that you've been thinking you should say, uh, and you have to act in ways that, that are perhaps fairly ugly and deranging of your relationship. Or you can just notice the thought and notice it subside, and the problem genuinely solves itself, right? It is a transitory state of consciousness that, that need not have any implication for what you say or do. So it, it just comes down to an ability to do that, and that, that's, you know, that's mindfulness. Uh, in, a, in a recent interview, the founder of DeepMind indicated that 2018 may be the year that AI makes a first scientific discovery. My question is, are there any ongoing collaborations between uh, uh, theoretical sciences and AIs working on problems like quantum gravity, etc.? 
Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Um, partly this depends a little bit on your definition of AI, right? Artificial intelligence. Certainly if you count it as anything that involves a neural network or deep learning, then they're used all the time. I mean, absolutely, we're in the big data era in science in the sense that um, at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where we discovered the Higgs boson, the amount of data that is produced in the collisions, this is a big particle accelerator where you're colliding protons and they turn into a bajillion particles in a, in a big detector and we track every one of these particles that is made. And there's so much data produced that we can actually only record to tape one out of a million collisions because we just can't record the data fast enough. So there's a huge problem, which is very quickly look at each event and say, is this interesting enough to keep? And then write the one in a million that really are interesting. You're still left with the world's largest database and the problem of let's search through all this data to find interesting things. Too hard for a human being to do all by themselves. So they turn these uh, neural nets and deep learning programs onto them. Uh, to look for anomalies, statistical differences from what we expect, and so forth. It's kind of very similar to uh, AlphaGo or something like that, playing chess or playing Go, in the sense that these are very constrained, limited, well-defined problems. What you really want, I don't want it, but what you want is a program that will be a theoretical physicist, right? A, a program, a, an AI that will invent a theory of gravity better than Albert Einstein's. So we don't even know how to start doing that. But we're inching toward that. That's, you know, that's where we'll eventually hope to go. So I hope the answer is not perverse incentives and eminence-based science. But I was curious, like with the case of Edward Lorenz, one day all these great mathematicians are just shrugging and saying it's noise. And then he makes a computational mistake. And all of a sudden, he's describing local laws that are being applied in a bunch of areas of science. So the multiverse just seems completely incredible to me. And I'm wondering if they're just following the equations towards explanation of an endless expression of every potential mitochondrial distribution in every cell that is ever divided. Is someone also maybe looking at maybe the um, particle is spinning counterclockwise or clockwise when you look at it because of its sensitive dependence on initial conditions, like something a little simpler than the multiverse? Yeah, but it's not simpler. So yes, there is a whole idea called super determinism, which says that uh, when we do in the lab quantum mechanical experiments, the best we can do is say there's a certain probability that the spin will be clockwise or counterclockwise, but nature could do better. There's hidden reasons why actually whatever the answer is going to be, it was determined long ago in the initial conditions of the universe. We just don't know. It's a matter of ignorance, not a matter of dynamics that creates these probabilities. To make that work, you need to take the simplicity of the many worlds interpretation, which just has a quantum state evolving according to Schrodinger's equation, and add new stuff to it. All the stuff that implies the many worlds is already there in everybody's formulation of quantum mechanics. Every other formulation of quantum mechanics is a getting rid of the other worlds formulation of quantum mechanics. Can you do that? Yes. Is it worth it? I'm not quite sure. The many worlds. There must have been polls done at conferences, and there are, yeah. there are, and what you find very quickly is they're wildly dependent on which conference you take the poll at. So, and it's because we don't think about it. It's because it is considered slightly disreputable. So, in certain corners in cosmology, everyone believes in the many worlds interpretation. In atomic physics or, you know, down-to-earth laboratory experiments, they're much more likely to be operational or even um, epistemic interpretations, where you say that the quantum state is not a feature of reality, it's a feature of your knowledge of the system. In philosophy departments, they like hidden variables interpretations, where there's really some thing that you can't measure that does determine what the answer is going to be. Mm. Okay. Sam, my question is for you, but uh, Sean, I'd love to hear your input. Um, I don't think you've ever given your views on nihilism, and I'm curious if you think that could ever be a practical worldview or at least living that way, and maybe when it comes down to um, Nietzsche's view on the individual. I'm just curious. 
nihilism as a practical worldview. That's, I mean, I guess it comes down to what you mean by nihilism, but I, I think it's implicit or really explicit in, in my view of morality, you know, in my realistic view of morality is that it's possible not to know what you're missing. So there's, there, you're, you're playing the, the best game you know how to play, ethically, emotionally, cognitively, in, in your relationships, constrained by whatever factors that are not allowing you to do the thing that you really think you should do in your, in your clearest moments. And yet there are better games. There, undoubtedly, there are better games that you could play if you, if you could just tune the knobs a little differently. Or, or the right influences came your way, or you had more coffee in the morning, or something changed. So, I mean, nihilism is not one of the best games that anyone can play. They're clearly, they're frontiers to our discovering new and useful things and figuring out new ways to collaborate with peaceful, honest, brilliant strangers. And nihilism doesn't capture that. And then nihilism doesn't indicate how good life could be. And Nietzsche was, I mean, I, you know, I, Nietzsche's, half of what he wrote is a little hard to read, but I mean, he, he, was, <laughs> he was clearly, he was, he, was, he was a brilliant and tortured mind who, you know, died hugging a horse, very likely in the throes of terminal syphilis, right? So he didn't, his life didn't end well. And he was never a happy man on his on this wild ride to you know meeting that horse and there's a kind of adolescent grandiosity i mean like you, his writing is what you would expect if you had a 14 year old ego married to brilliant linguistic gifts right just this supercharged adolescent infuriated overlooked chip on the shoulder the size of a continent ego and that should be nobody's notion of perfect self-actualization, right? I mean, he's, he, he does not advertise his moral wisdom. So I, I, mean, I, I can read much of Nietzsche with pleasure, but it's not, it's not a mind that I would be eager to emulate. I hope that dealt yeah. with the question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question is for Sam, but I just want to say I thank you guys both for coming here and speaking to us. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. Um, um, I just want, also want to say thank you for book Waking Up. It changed my total view on spirituality and meditation. I did martial arts for many years, and a lot of times I didn't take that stuff seriously. I just focused on the fighting part, uh -huh. and it just that totally changed my view because the secular aspects okay. I really enjoy. So, but my other question is: um, You have problems in the martial arts community of spreading your secular views on spirituality and meditation. You know, I'm not such a fan of, mar of explicitly marrying martial arts with even things as esoteric as meditation. I mean, I think, I think they're separable disciplines, and you, you certainly don't have to be interested in martial arts to be very interested in understanding the dynamics of your own suffering and figuring out how to overcome it, and vice versa. But people who are not into martial arts probably just don't know this is a, a genre of, of ignorance that exists, but y you should watch fake martial arts videos because it is this is the most astonishing instance of self-deception that has ever existed and the fact the fact that it exists the fact that it's possible to think you have martial skills that you manifestly don't have and then to put those to a test in a way that just completely disconfirms the, your belief that you have them Right. I mean, so the, the, the classic example is this: he's billed as an Aikido master. I, I can't imagine any Aikido school wants to own him, but he was this master who was imagined that he could knock his students down at a distance, and he would move his hands, and his students would fall and trip all over themselves. And he clearly was teaching the teaching this art for years, and it was just this massive collaboration between credulous students and now a credulous master who the, the students clearly thought they were being knocked over by his magic powers, and he thought he was knocking them over. And then he put out this invitation to the martial artists of the world that he could take all comers, and someone showed up at his dojo and just punched him in the face repeatedly. <laughs> and and the, so, so it is possible to be that confused about, this, about the very thing that it should be impossible to be confused about, whether or not you can fight somebody who's attacking you, right? And there are whole cultures that have promulgated this confusion. And so it's, if there's ever a doubt 
as to whether or not religious confusion and political confusion, conspiracy thinking, and all of this stuff is as hard a problem as it seems to be. It's just this proves just how readily the human mind can confuse itself with things like confirmation bias and self-deception. So anyway, that that's a, a rant that will pay off if you actually get on YouTube and, and look at fake martial arts videos. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming and definitely come back to Portland again. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is for Sean. Quantum field theory or string theory and why? Good. So quantum field theory is right in the sense that it is the best explanation of how nature works within a certain regime. Um, it, it's equivalent to saying this is a chair. No, that's, no, nothing we're going to learn about the world will ever t tell us that this was not a chair after all, right? We might learn that, oh, it's act the chair is made of atoms and molecules and, and things like that. We might learn deeper truths about it, but it's still a chair. String theory is an attempt to go beyond quantum field theory. And in fact, string theory includes quantum field theory in, in an appropriate limit. It starts out with this very innocent sounding idea that rather than if you zoom in on an electron, rather than it being a single point, it is actually a little loop of string. You just say, what if that were true? You're not allowed to ask what the string is made of. It's made of string stuff, okay? But what happens is if you try to make that into a consistent quantum mechanical theory, you end up predicting the existence of things like gravity. And when this first happened in the early 70s, people were really annoyed. They, weren't, they didn't want gravity. And then someone... In fact, my Caltech colleague, John Schwartz, came along and said, you know, gravity exists. Let's just take it, right? And let's imagine that this is a theory of quantum gravity. So it is still the leading theory of quantum gravity right now. Uh, we still have no idea whether it's true or not in the sense that it describes nature any better than uh, any other extension of quantum field theory does. So the theories are not comparable. Quantum field theory is absolutely right in its domain of validity. But the domain of validity only goes so far. It doesn't work for black holes or the Big Bang, et cetera. String theory might work for those more extreme circumstances. We just don't know yet. So apologies to those of you who are in line, but we have to make it the last two questions. So over here. Thank you very much for yeah. uh, being here tonight. Uh, I have a question uh, for both of you, uh, if, if I may. Sure. I can have a small question for Sam, but the bigger question is that uh, recently I saw Joe Rogan ha having an interview with uh, Brett and Heather Weinstein mm -hmm. about evolutionary psychology. So is that in some way, are we gonna expect some change in how we use technology or uh, we apply that to our politics moving forward in our civilization? And the other small question, being that Portland has a big vegan community, Sam, would you ever consider going back to a plant-based plant -based diet? Uh, I, w I would consider it. If I felt that I could be healthy doing it, I would do it. It's just I, I, every time I experiment with this, my health seems to go haywire. And, and again, the onus could be on me, just you know, what a bad and lazy cook I am. And I mean, there's the, there could be some fix, but... Yeah, I'm still my my diet is a work in progress, and I I'm sensitive to the ethical concerns. I'm not sure I got the question with respect to Brett and Heather. I I think that was a very interesting conversation. I actually did listen to that podcast. It's very useful to understand ourselves in terms of evolution. So evolutionary psychology is a real domain of insight into what it's like to be us as social primates. But most of what we mean by progress culturally and civilizationally is a matter of defying the dictates of evolution. Evolution can't see or care about most of what we now care about. And it certainly can't tell us how to navigate in, in this space of possible experience. It equips us to spawn and die, essentially. And it says nothing about the wisdom or utility or, or our ability of, of, of doing things like good science or interesting science or colonizing Mars or, or doing anything that may be good for us or bad for us. And we have to figure all of this out with the tools that, that evolution has given us. And then the ones we invent by virtue of the progress we make. So connection between science and morality has two very different tracks you can run on. And they're, they're not in contradiction with one another, but they're, they're just different. You can descriptively understand why we have the moral intuitions we have. 
And then you can ask the further question, what would be good for us to do given what's possible? What would maximize human well-being in ways that we have yet to discover? And that latter question has almost nothing to do with how we got here. So yeah, they're, they're separate projects. Hi, Sam. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the Waking Up podcast. Thank you for your guests. They're really brilliant and insightful. And I, yeah, I enjoy well, thank, it. thank you all for coming out. My real question is trying to square essentially first free will and awareness with a privilege and responsibility. When you're looking at your experience and what, what you're doing and what opportunities you have, mm. how do you equate those with what responsibilities you have? Well, I think I mean, this is a hard question, but I think, I think luck has immense moral significance. And I think those of us who are lucky, those of us who have privileges that we didn't manufacture and opportunities that we didn't create, have a responsibility to make the most of those opportunities and privileges in ways that benefit other people and most relevantly and, and conscious creatures in general. So we have a responsibility. I mean, it's, it's meaningful to make the world better than it was the day before mm -hmm. in the only way in which anything can be meaningful. It, it, again, in, in terms of the, the well-being of, of anyone who could be affected by what you do. And I mean, we're, we're immensely privileged. I mean, just, just imagine we, we all had the leisure and interest and free time to come out for a conversation like this. Think of all the things we're not suffering. Think of all the unlucky variables that are not being imposed upon us so that we have the free attention to think about any of this stuff. We're immensely privileged with respect to what's actually going on for most people on planet Earth right now, and we're immensely privileged with respect to prior times on planet Earth. I mean, this is kind of goes to what you know Steven Pinker's new book is about. It's like, in so many ways, this is the, the luckiest time to be alive. But it's also the, the time where we seem to be facing a, a kind of bottleneck. I mean, it's, it, it's not, you don't have to be a crazy futurist to worry that the next hundred years could go very, very wrong or very, very right and, and matter in ways that most centuries just haven't mattered quite as much. And so I, I, th I feel like, again, conversation is the most important thing because I think ideas matter more than anything else. Ideas, bad ideas are what get good people to do terrible things. And so the criticism of bad ideas and the excavation of better ideas is really, I think, what we need to do as human beings at this moment. And it's, you know, that, that touches everything. It touches science, it touches politics, it touches just how we have our personal relationships and, and the kinds of things we do on social media and don't do. And it's just, it is a matter of, of changing people's minds in the end, you know, insofar as I can do anything to do that. I mean, that's, that's, I'm spending a lot of time trying to do that. And, you know, all of you are, by coming out, are making that possible. So, again, thank you all for coming out. It's, been, it's really an honor to do this. And thank you. For coming all right. Out. Thank you. Thank you. If you find the Waking Up podcast valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can review it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can blog about it or discuss it on your own podcast. Or you can support it directly. And you can do this by subscribing through my website. That's samharris.org. And there you'll find subscriber-only content, which includes my Ask Me Anything episodes. You also get access to advanced tickets to my live events, as well as streaming video of some of these events. And you also get to hear the bonus questions from many of these interviews. And then there's the Waking Up course, an app built for iOS and Android, which I'll be releasing soon as a subscription service, which supporters of the podcast get for free. All of these things and more you'll find on my website at samharris.org. And again, thank you for your support of the show. It's listeners like you that make all of this possible.